Hi, this is Dave. Uh, welcome back to another installment of Dr. Dave's Diversions. In this episode, I'm going to show you the first Macintosh computer I ever owned, talk to you a little bit about how I was first introduced to Macintoshes, and I'm going to throw down the gauntlet for Marchintosh and say, I think I have the fastest Mac Plus that existed 30 years ago, and I'm betting that it might be the fastest Mac Plus that's on YouTube today. So stick around. So I haven't posted anything for a couple of weeks and it's not because I wasn't doing things. It was because I was really excited that Marchintosh was coming up and I have a bunch of ideas for projects in it and I needed to do some prep work. One of the things I did was converted my Amiga to use an SD, uh, uh, SCSI to SD card, uh, specifically version 6 in there. This is the 5.2 version card, but I had a lot of trouble with that and I was spending some time on that the last couple of weeks. The other thing that I did is I got together with Joe from Joe's Computer Museum and Steve from Temporary Offline and Matt from RetroBits and we did uh, an hour and a half plus long session diagnosing four different Commodore 64s that had problems on Temporary Offline's channel. So if you're interested in seeing that, look in my 8-bit uh, Commodore playlist. It's there. Otherwise, head over to Temporary Offline. A uh, really cool bunch of guys to work with and I'm looking forward to seeing them again. So I did do, did do that video. But let's move on. It's Marchintosh now. So what's going on with Marchintosh? Well, as you just saw in that opening, my first Mac, or the Mac that I'm going to show you today, is actually an Amiga 2000. And it's an Amiga 2000 that runs a Macintosh emulator called Amax 2. This one right here. And you can see I have the original box because I bought this about 1988, perhaps 89, and ran it first on my Amiga 500 on the 68000 there. And then now I run it on the Amiga 2000. The interesting thing about it, and why I'm going to claim that this is the potentially the fastest Mac Plus there is, is it runs um, on Macintosh plus 128K ROMs. I'll show you the hardware in, the, in one of the upcoming chapters. But the other thing is my machine has the RCS Management Fusion 40, the first 68040 card for an Amiga. And so it's a Mac Plus with a 68040. And uh, that's an unbeatable match and it was a pretty neat machine to have back in 1991. And like I said, I think it when when I assembled it, there wasn't a Mac faster than that. So what are we going to do in the video today? Well, I'll show you the hardware because Amax is both a hardware and a software solution, and it went through some, a number of versions. I have the original version, uh, then I upgraded to Amax 2, um, and then I upgraded to Amax 2.5. So the software I'll be running is Amax 2.5. The hardware I'll be using is exactly what's in here. And uh, curiously, even though I run an Amiga, I have an assemblage of Mac hardware. And I showed you a glimpse of that in the opening there. Uh, SciQuest drive, I've got an original uh, Apple 20 meg hard drive, the 20SC on SCSI. I've got an external floppy for the Mac. Uh, let's just get, get into it and I'll show you the hardware for Amax and how it works with, uh, with the Amiga. Then we'll go into, uh, I'll, I'll show you the screen and we'll run some benchmarks there where I show you how fast this machine actually is and show you a couple of the applications that I used to use when I was in college and just out of college, why it was compelling for me to have a Mac emulator. Then uh, come back at the end and we'll wrap it up and I'll show you uh, how I'm going to navigate the rest of March and, uh, Marchintosh, the event, by uh, going through a junk box of a bunch of Mac stuff that you'll see will be great. Uh, uh, seeds for us doing a bunch of bunch more Mac, uh, Marchintosh projects. So here's the Amax hardware. Uh, this was typically referred to as the Amax cartridge, even though the Amiga doesn't have a cartridge slot. Uh, it looks sort of like a cartridge. It actually plugs onto the Amiga's floppy disk port on the back of the machine. Uh, it, it, this plugs onto the Amiga side and it has a pass through so you can plug or chain another Omega floppy disk drive off there. And then it's got a connector for uh, an Apple uh, floppy drive, a, a real Apple compatible floppy drive. I don't have an Apple brand floppy drive. I bought a sort of a knockoff brand, this one called Cutting Edge, but it can read uh, single and double sided um, 
Macintosh floppies. So let's take a look at this. Uh, on the, well, you said it's made by ReadySoft. On the back, it says made in Canada. It has these little legs that you install on the case, depending on which model you have. These short legs are for the Amiga 2000. There's some longer legs if you're gonna plug it into an Amiga 1000. So the device is this printed circuit board with those connectors attached and a little bit of circuitry. We look at here, it says uh, Amax copyright 1989 ReadySoft. Uh, this, I probably bought this in 89. Uh, and here are the two uh, Macintosh 128K ROMs. And these ones are labeled B and C. It says Mac 128 on it. So these are the ROMs, the 128K ROMs, uh, I guess even an odd from the, from the Macintosh Plus. And that's why uh, my machine, when I'm running it, uh, thinks it's a Macintosh Plus. These ROMs, um, I guess the idea was that, you know, the reason why this was legal from a point of view of, of comparing to a Macintosh or from a Apple's point of view was that the intention, at least stated, is that you went and found some real Mac ROMs. And uh, I'll uh, inset here um, a price list that I found from the company that I often bought equipment from, Safe Harbor, uh, which just by coincidence happened to be run by somebody that lived in my neighborhood at the time. So I, he would just drop things off at my door or I would go pick them up at his house. Uh, but it shows uh, the Amax device itself with the software was $135 in 1990. And also um, the Mac, the, the Mac ROMs, the real Mac ROMs were also $135. So uh, I presume they were selling, you know, ROMs that were re recovered somehow from, from real Apple computers. But of course, there was also a market, uh, some, you know, a black market or something for these things. And my vague recollection is Mac ROMs for Hackintoshes could be gotten for, you know, probably $50 or less. So, um, anyway, so, you know, I'll plug the, this device on here. Uh, it's a little inconvenient because it sticks a long way outside the back of the, the Amiga 2000, but my desk has space for it. You could put it on some kind of extension cable and ReadySoft sold an extension cable if you wanted to do that. But kind of a clever design with the pass-through. My guess is that the device actually looks somehow to the Amiga like it's a floppy drive. It doesn't show as a floppy drive, but um, one of the things they say in the ReadySoft manual is when you chain another device on it, it's going to increase the floppy drive number by one for the ones that are chained past this device. So anyway, let's put it back together and go back to uh, putting it on the back of the machine and, uh, and running the software. All right, so here we are at the Amiga and we're booting it from scratch. You see the Fusion 40 come up and load the Amiga uh, Kickstart ROM into 32-bit memory so that it's faster. And uh, I run Amiga Release 2, which is time appropriate for 30 years ago in 1991. That was the latest release of Amiga software. Um, to run Amax, I have it in this folder here. There's an application called Amax Startup. If you want to start it through the GUI, you start it like this. And what it brings us to is this setup screen or preferences screen. You can also run it with an auto switch where it would skip this, but this is nice and it kind of give you a little tour of what Amax can do. So let's look at what these menus say. Video preferences, I'm, I have a deinterlacer and I'm running this off VGA and recording it from VGA. So we're gonna stick to high res interlaced mode and keep the um, Macintosh screen size, the size it was in the Amiga, which is about the best that my machine can do. Um, let's go to the hard disk preferences. So Amax can mount um, partitions on the Amiga's hard drive and it will do so for any ones that start with either the letters AMAX or AX. So I've got two partitions and these are on my um, SD card uh, with the uh, SCSI to SD device uh, version six. Uh, what I, this one called AX2 is a backup of AX1 in, for safekeeping in case something goes wrong. Uh, again, <laughs> with the SD card and, I, and it trashes that partition. So let's not mount that to keep the backup safe. And then lastly, the memory preferences. Because here we're running a 68040, uh, we have cache controls. Uh, data cache is on by default, meaning they found that that usually works well. Uh, copyback cache, what copyback cache is, is, it basically says when the processor is working in cache memory, uh, can it keep working there 
and wait till the end of its operations and then flush the cache back to memory. And you can imagine that's faster. So we're gonna run it in that mode. And some applications don't work well with that because they might be going, they might have, you might have peripherals or something with dual port RAM that's going at uh, the real memory when the processor is busy and that wouldn't work, but we can, we can use it here. MMU is enabled because it's 68040. We can choose all different memory configurations. The original Mac Plus could have up to four megabytes installed. So just for the heck of it, let's run it that way. We, I can run with seven and a half. Um, I've got eight megs of, uh, of a 32-bit RAM on the Fusion 40 card. Well, let's run with 4 meg and say start MX. So at this point, what it would do typically is it would go to that cartridge and read the, the content from the uh, ROMs and copy them into uh, memory uh, to, to run the, the Mac emulator. Uh, in this case, I have patched Emax to read the copy of the ROMs right from disk because it's a lot faster and it reads in a split second like you just saw there. So now we start. So we just booted System 605 on the Mac that quickly. It's asking us if we want to initialize the RAM disk that we have set up. Sure, let's call that RAM disk. Running disk, and now we have a RAM disk. So um, I can hear my Amiga floppies are, are, are uh, clicking because that's what they do when they're looking for a disk. So I'm going to put a couple floppies in there just to keep that quiet for the sake of the recording. And let's take a look at this. So. What are we running here? Well, we're not about the finder. We're running finder 615 on system 605. This is, again, this is what I was running when I graduated from college in 91. Uh, this is uh, system six was the operating system when I finished school. And so that's what I was used to running. Uh, we can go, there was a neat tool called Mac Envy, which was a, that fit in the control panel that can tell you more about the machine. So let's see what it says it is. Mac Envy says, oh, sure enough, you got four mega memory and you're running uh, Macintosh 68040. There was never a 68040 available for the Mac Plus as far as I know. Uh, you can ask it things like, you know, uh, what system versions you're running. You can have it look at the SCSI disks. It sees the SCSI disks. So one of the cool things about Amax is it can go directly to the SCSI uh, using, and, and it can see, here it can see uh, SCSI devices one and two, both of which are on my uh, SCSI test D card. And you can mount um, other peripherals like the ones I showed in the opening. I have a SciQuest removable drive. I've got other peripherals they can hang off there. Apparently you can run Apple scanners and all this kind of stuff because the emulator can pass through information on SCSI. The screen size, we're at 680 by 460. That was inherited from Workbench. Unusual size, but uh, and you can see, oh, by the way, uh, this kind of blue on white color, that's, we can choose that. Uh, I happen to choose that. I think it might be the default for Amax, just something that looks a little bit different than the black and white, which is all that, of course, a Mac Plus would have had. Can run life in here. Anyway, so um, let's open up the hard drive and see what we have here. So a bunch of these folders are things that I put on here over 30 years ago. And what was neat is, I hadn't run this Mac emulator in decades. So uh, it was basically a time capsule of uh, all my resumes when I was sending out trying to get a job after college, uh, letters to people. And uh, we'll look at a couple of those because it's a little bit entertaining. And uh, But before we do that, let's benchmark the system. So Speedometer 306, uh, quite an old version of Speedometer is what you need to run on a system this old. Let's run that. So it has two batches of tests. Um, let's say it's run them all. All right, that's done. 
So uh, speedometer, if you know the application, you know it can do uh, comparisons to other systems. Uh, it has a library of known systems. And here's the graph for my machine. So what we're seeing is it's saying this CPU is 16 times faster than a Mac Classic. Uh, the graphics are six and a half times faster. The disk is nine times faster. Or the math is 17 times faster. And it's overall performance rating subjectively by the author, presumably, of speedometers. It gets rated at 12. Now we can compare it to other machines here. And this is its entire list. Um, the, at the time when I was in school, we, I remember us having a Mac 2FX. That was the nicest Mac that I'd ever worked on that was a real Macintosh. And, here, and this machine you know, beats the Mac 2FX at most things. It, doesn't, it looks like the Mac 2FX must have had a math, math coprocessor because um, it's, a, it's faster than this machine, which doesn't have a math coprocessor. Uh, the, the disk test is wildly erratic, I think, on, on this. I noticed that depending on how I change, set the cache on my control panel um, here uh, you get different uh, performance I've got a two and a half meg uh, large uh, disk cache and that yielded the highest disk performance ratings but uh, you can see uh, of the machines that I had known at the time my personal machine this this, this Amiga was faster than all the known models Mac and uh, Apple introduced the Mac Quadra 700 late in 1991. It was their first 68040 machine, and this is how my machine compares to it. On CPU, um, it's faster than the Mac Quadra 700 clocked also at 25 megahertz. No idea why. Um, graphics are a little slower, disks a lot faster, uh, math is slower because I don't have a math coprocessor that the Quadra 700 did. And then when you look at these other ratings, there are some other benchmarks uh, that are faster on my machine than they were on the Mac Quadra. Um, and, and for instance, the Towers of Hanoi problem, it runs faster ever so slightly. And I think this is, these are basically the integer tests. Uh, integer performance tests run faster on, on this machine than they do on a real Mac, even with a 68040. So um, anyway, so that, that's, that, that's that benchmark. Let's quit out of uh, quit out of speedometer, and let, let's look at uh, what my machine looked like back about the time I was 21 years old uh, when I had this and was uh, dying to get a job out of school. So three applications that are of interest uh, that can kind of uh, showcase what I used this machine for. I, I mean, I was really productive with this. That's what I used Amax for. Um, in contrast, for instance, to DOS uh, with my PC bridge board, didn't use that for anything. But this I used for doing real work. Um, let's, let's look at a, a couple of pieces of classroom work. In the physics department, I study TTL logic stuff. And uh, let's look at, for instance, one of those. So this program, DesignWorks, is one that um, those of us that were computer science students like to use in addition to um, you know, using a breadboard over in the physics department. And here, here's a, one of the assignments that I looked at earlier. It looks like what I've done here is taken the, 70, um, the 7483 uh, logic chip. And the 7483, uh, it's a Motorola 74LS83. It's a four bit binary full adder with fast carry is the way it's described in the specs. And so what have I built here? Well. This was a super neat Mac application. You basically can wire up these lines and turn these switches on and off. And then you can clock the, the circuit and see how it performs. So what it seems like I did here, if I reset this, it seems like what I did here is I can set, uh, here's the inputs A and B, the four bit numbers that it's gonna add. And what we've done here is connected the output of the circuit back as one of the inputs. So we can just keep adding what's specified on uh, input B to this four-digit accumulator up here. It's got bits B0 and B1 on. Okay, there we go. So now it's got uh, bits 0 and 1 set. And so it's reading, I guess, that's the value 3. And if I clock it again, it's changed to now having um, 4 and 2 set. So it's 6. And I clock it again, 
and now it's changed to having the eight and the one nine set. So basically what I've done is, what this is doing is every time I clock it, it's adding three, which is bit zero and bit one, specifying three is the input value there in, um, in, the, in the B that, uh, bits. So it's basically an accumulator. You can, I mean, you can just uh, count up by any number you specify in, in these four bits. If I switch it down to saying just one, so only bit zero is, and now if I clock it, you can see it counting up. Let me go all the way to zero, counts up one, two, three. So one of the class assignments was, you know, build that circuit that was a, a counter that could count up by any, uh, you know, value for, uh, that could be specified in four bits. The other thing I have here is, uh, let's look at a couple of these letters I wrote. Um, let's see, January 1991, uh, Brooks letter. So here's me applying for a job and I'm saying, I saw the, I, so I'm still finishing school and I say, Dear Mr. Brooks, senior ad of January 4th in the Milwaukee Journal um, for a Macintosh specialist. And I did, I'd almost forgotten I'd consider myself a Macintosh expert at this time, but I had spent years uh, training people on using Macintoshes. Uh, I say in the letter that I maintain three campus Macintosh networks, of approximately 60 total machines. Uh, and these three networks were tied to our campus ethernet. So what we had was um, Macintosh labs with tens of machines in them. And then they were all connected with Fairlawn phone net, which I would wire up. And then we had a, to, uh, a really neat uh, device called the Cayman Gator Box that could take Apple Talk on uh, either Fairlawn phone net or real, real Apple Talk hardware and connect it to an ethernet using either a uh, thin net or thick net. And then we had our AT&T 3B Unix machine, which had an you know, a AY and that was on thick net. We had a sun machine in a different lab that was on thin net. And because I was a radio amateur as well, I knew how to solder all of those things and I would work with it. So, uh, so you know, I discovered this little trove of, uh, of my old letters uh, trying to get jobs different places. I guess I'm glad that they didn't uh, offer me a job because I found a really good one instead. Um, let's get one other one that I think was kind of funny. Here, this one called PW Letter. So here's me writing to Personal Workstation Magazine, totally nerding out. Dear editors, in David Peltz, Peltz's article, Macintosh, the Rodney Danger Field of Technical Computing, he states, the Macintosh is the only platform capable of running applications under all three major operating systems, DOS, Unix, and its own native macOS. Untrue, three exclamation points are right. The Commodore Amiga can do all these things. <laughs> Uh, Commodore has developed Unix System 5 Revision 4 for the Amiga, now available on the Amiga 3000 UX. Uh, ReadySoft's AMX2 package allows the Amiga to emulate a Mac, and Commodore's on Bridgeboard can run MS-DOS, and, uh, and the Amiga can run Amiga-DOS applications. Boy, was I incensed. Anyway, super funny. Uh, luckily, I'm not as tightly wound as that, or at least I'm not going to waste time writing to a magazine's editor to defend the Amiga. But super funny for these Mac people who the Mac was in, in everywhere. I mean, campuses had them all over the places, and they're acting like uh, they're the Rodney Danger field of the computing business and got not getting any respect. Really crazy. Oh, this is neat. So what this is, um, I was a radio amateur then, and. Uh, It looks like what I did is I found an image of the, the Great Lakes region, which is the nine region. And um, here's my QSL card from back then. Uh, these are postcards that uh, then I took to a printer to get printed and you'd send these to people you made contacts with to verify that uh, you'd contacted or to share information about how their station was performing. So um, pretty neat. And it really, really highlights that I use the Mac like crazy to do real stuff, the Amiga. I, while I wanted to be able to do that stuff, it, it was I, I used it for fun, and the Mac I used to do uh, work and, and projects that were in desktop publishing. So let's get out of there and wrap things up for this episode. So that's a look at Amax, uh, specifically Amax 2 on the Amiga. And uh, like I said, I'm throwing down the gauntlet. If you got if you got a faster Mac Plus, something based on Mac Plus ROM, the machine that thinks it's a Mac Plus, that's faster than this, gets better performance numbers with speedometer, uh, let me know. And uh, I'll, I'll make a, anybody that's working on uh, Macintosh emulation on the Amiga, let's make a playlist of it. So uh, get in touch with me in the comments or send me an email via my contact information. 
So I said, uh, so for the rest of March, uh, you know, I've got this box labeled Mac stuff that I pulled out of my crawl space. And let me give you a glimpse of what's in there and what's to come. So one of the first things I did is I collected, um, I used to work for the university and people would put this junk out in the hallways all the time. I collected a whole bunch of Mac stuff. I have about 10 Infocom and Microsoft games in their original packaging and we'll spend one of the upcoming episodes showing you those and uh, running them if we can. The other thing that's interesting about this is these are from the original Macintosh with 400k discs and we can run them on this machine. The other thing uh, that I'm excited to try out and I showed you in the intro is I have a real Macintosh mouse um, and the original Macintosh mouse. And what I saw online is a lot of people are taking Amiga mice and rewiring them to work on the Mac because that Macintosh mouse is so hard to find. I'm going to do it the other way around. I'm going to make an adapter so I can use the Macintosh mouse with my Amiga emulator. That'll be a fun, quick little hardware project. Um, and then, uh, check this out. Uh, you might know that the Mac Plus and the Macintosh, they had no expansion. There were no card slots or anything, but what they did have is a SCSI bus. This is an Asante ENSC uh, Ethernet over SCSI device, and I plugged it in. It powers up. I don't know if it's working, but one of the projects is we're going to see if we can get that working with AMAX2 on Amiga, and that'll be the first time my Amiga has ever been on an Ethernet or connected to the net, so pretty cool. Uh, anyway, so come back and, uh, and join me again for Marchintosh. Uh, if you're interested in uh, the, the 68040 machine, I have another video that I'll link uh, in the description uh, about where I've showed off the inside of that machine before. But uh, join us all in Marchintosh. It's going to be a big community event. I'm really happy that uh, Ron and Joe put it together and a whole slew of people have signed up to do Marchintosh videos on uh, you know some of the old Macs. I, I happen to use uh, one from the beige Mac era. Uh, as we went into the platinum era, so I've got a mix of beige and platinum Mac equipment, but I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys got, and take care. I'll see you soon.